Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we're just going to give you all a moment to just get settled, join into this uh, space. Um, so just, yeah, we'll give you a moment to uh, get situated and let the attendees in. All right, I think we'll just get started. Um, and as people trickle in, we'll just kind of go from there. So hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Savannah and I am one of the media editors with Transforming Anthropology. Our current issue of TA is a special issue dedicated to Leith Mullings, a Jamaican born distinguished professor of anthropology at the City University of New York Graduate Center, a student, mother and activist, Leith was so generous in her offerings, both within and beyond the academy. We wanted to hold space for Leith and community with you all, and we've invited the contributors from the special issue who engaged with Leith's work to speak today. We are joined by doctors Aylin Bowles, Michael Blakey, Deborah Thomas, Lee Baker, Rache Danielle Barnes, Alaka Wali, and uh, after hearing from the panelists, we'd like to open it up to the audience and invite folks to share. Um, we, we would like this to be collaborative. Uh, the webinar format has its limitations for that, but uh, we'd love it if you uh, participate in the chat throughout the conversations. And uh, if you wanna use the hashtag remembering Leith on Twitter, uh, please feel free to use that. We can continue this conversation outside of the space of this webinar. Um, and we'll open it up at the end uh, as well for folks to share. So, um, and it might, yeah, we'll just, we'll, we just wanna be in community with you all and uh, in, in dialogue about Leith Mullings and her incredible impact. So um, this session is also being recorded. It will be available on the TA YouTube page at a later date. So you can look for that. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm so honored to introduce our panelists today. Um, yeah, we had an amazing lineup um, and it was really special to read all the contributions and the ways that everyone engaged with Lee's work. Um, so yeah, it's quite an honor today to have you all here. So Dr. Aylin Bowles is professor in the Department of Women's Studies and an affiliate faculty member in anthropology, African-American studies, comparative literature, and American studies at the University of Maryland College Park. Bowles authored Telling the Story Straight, Black Feminist Intellectual Thought and Anthropology, published in Transforming Anthropology, Catherine Dunham's First Journey in Anthropology, and Catherine Dunham, edited by Elizabeth Chin, and numerous books and articles. Bowles is past president of the Caribbean Studies Association, the Association for Feminist Anthropology, and the Society for Anthropology of North America. She received a 2013 Legacy Award from the Association of Black Anthropologists. Michael L. Blakey is National Endowment for the Humanities Professor of Anthropology, Africana Studies, and American Studies, and Founding Director of the Institute for Historical Biology at William & Mary. Blakey held professorships at Spelman College, Columbia, Brown, La Sapienza, and Howard University, where he founded the W. Montague Cobb Biological Anthropology Laboratory. He served as President of the Association of Black Anthropologists, and member of the editorial boards of American Anthropologist, American Antiquity, and American Antiquity. Blakey represented the United States on the Council of the Fourth World Archaeological Congress in Cape Town, South Africa. He is a member of the Scholarly Advisory Committee of the National Museum of African American History and Culture of the Smithsonian Institute, where he previously held the position of Research Associate in Physical Anthropology at the National Museum of Natural History. He was scientific director of the New York African Burial Ground Project, the sophisticated, the most sophisticated bioarchaeological project in the United States. The Manhattan site became a US national monument in 2007. In 2021, Blakey was presented the President's Award of the American Anthropological Association, the Legacy Award of the Association of Black Anthropologists, and the Plumeri Award for Faculty Excellence at William & Mary. Deborah Thomas is the R. Jean Brownlee Professor of Anthropology and the Director of the Center for Experimental Ethnography at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, 
She's also a research associate with the Visual Identities in Art and Design Research Center at the University of Johannesburg. Her recent book, Political Life in the Wake of the Plantation, Sovereignty Witnessing Repair, was awarded the Gordon K. and Sybil Lewis Book Award for the Caribbean Studies Association in 2021. The Senior Book Prize from the American Ethnological Society in 2020, and was also the runner up for the Gregory Bateson Prize in the same year. She's also the author of Exceptional Violence, Embodied Citizenship in Transnational Jamaica, and Modern Blackness, Nationalism, Globalization, and the Politics of Culture in Jamaica and is co-editor of the volume Globalization and Race. Thomas co-directed and co-produced the documentary films Bad Friday, Four Days in May, and she's the co-curator of, multi, of a multimedia installation titled Bearing Witness, Four Days in West Kingston, which opened at the Penn Museum in November, 2017. From 2016 to 2020, Thomas was the editor-in-chief of American Anthropologist, the flagship journal of the American Anthropological Association. Prior to Thomas's life as an academic, she was a professional dancer with the New York-based Urban Bushwoman. Dr. Roche Danielle Barnes is a sociocultural anthropologist whose teaching and research specializations are at the intersection of Black feminist theories, work and family policy, and African diasporic, raced, gendered, and classed identity formation. Her research focus has been on Black women and Black motherhood. Barnes is an award-winning scholar. Her book, Raising the Race, Black Career Women Redefine Marriage, Motherhood, and Community, won the 2017 Distinguished Book Award for the, for the Race, Gender, Class section of the American Sociological Association. She's been awarded fellowships from the Ford Foundation, the Sloan Foundation, and the Mellon Foundation. Additionally, Barnes has held a research affiliations with the Clayman Institute at Stanford University and Yale Center for the Study of Race, Indigeneity, and Transnational Migration. Her conceptual framework, Black Strategic Mothering, has been used to understand the complexity of Black women's survival strategies as they pertain to motherhood, family, work, and community over time and space. She is currently working on two um, book projects that expound on these strategies. She has co-founded and chaired the Association of Black Anthropologists Mentoring Program and was the president of the Association of Black Anthropologists. Her efforts were recognized with the 2019 AAA Oxford University Press Excellence and Undergraduate Teaching of Anthropology Award and the 2020 American Anthropological Association President's Award. Alaka Wali is curator of North American Anthropology in the Science and Education Division of the Field Museum. She was the founding director of the Center for Cultural Understanding and Change from 1995 to 2010. During that time, she pioneered the development of participatory social science action research and community engagement processes based in museum science to further access of museum resources for excluded communities. Before joining the museum, she worked with Dr. Leith Mullings to document the consequences of structural racism on Black women's reproductive and social health in Harlem, New York. Currently, she curates the North American collection comprised largely of material culture of Native Americans from the 19th century to the present and works closely with colleagues to implement environmental conservation programs that privilege economic and cultural autonomy for politically marginalized people in both Chicago and the Amazon regions of Peru. Her research focuses on the relationship between art and the capacity for social resilience. Alaka was born in India and maintained strong, strong ties to her birth homeland. Dr. Lee Baker is a professor of cultural anthropology, sociology, and African and African American studies at Duke University. He received his BS from Portland State University and doctorate in anthropology <laughs> from Temple University. He has been a resident fellow at Harvard's W.E.B. Du Bois Institute, the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, John Hopkins Institute for Global Studies, the University of Ghana Lagan, and the American Philosophical Society, and the National Humanities Center. His books include From Savage to Negro, Anthropology and the Construction of Race, Life in America, Identity and Everyday Experience, and Anthropology in the Racial Politics of Culture. Although he focuses on the history of anthropology, he has published numerous articles on such wide ranging subjects as sociolinguistics to race and democracy. Baker is also the recipient of the Richard K. Lublin Distinguished Teaching Award. He served as Dean of Academic Affairs from 2008 to 2016. It is an absolute honor and privilege to be in conversation with you all and to honor Leith Mullings in this way. So thank you all for joining us. Um, I think that I'd like to just start with a general question for everyone. Um, how have your encounters with Leith Mullings work and legacy been generative for your own engagement in and outside of the academy? Um, 
And in what ways do you plan on continuing to call upon LEAF in your work? Um, I don't know who wants to go first, but I'll put that to you. Oh, Dr. Barnes. Hey, um, I want to start um, because I want to say thank you um, first and foremost. Um, oh, I'm so appreciative for us holding the space for, for LEAF. And, um, and I'm so appreciative to Aisha and to Machiko for allowing the space within transforming anthropology for this big dream I had to honor Leaf with a special issue. And, um, and I wanna thank each of the contributors for being willing and able um, to pull something together so quickly um, because we were really stretching it with the deadlines, me included. <laughs> I was the last one to get my article in. Um, and I just wanna, I just wanna just really thank everyone uh, for taking this time. And I thank everyone for being here to take this time to honor Lee's memory. Um, I, I think I said in this piece, but I know I said in feminist anthropology um, in the reflection I gave there that um, not many people know that I started my graduate career at City University Graduate Center under Leaf's direction. Um, Janetta Cole, who was my mentor at Selman College where I was an undergraduate and uh, engaging in anthropology for the first time uh, suggested I apply there and work with LEAF, and, uh, and I did. I went, I spent a year there taking classes, um, and uh, a lot of things happened in my life that made it such that I needed to return to Atlanta, and I finished my work at Emory um, with Janetta Cole um, as one of my mentors there, uh, but I continued, even though I had left CUNY, I continued to the Leaf's work as generative um, to my own, being a US scholar at the time um, uh, on our own terms had just come out, um, was just coming out. And um, as, a US, as a US scholar, I really needed uh, to see that that was possible within anthropology to do work on Black women, on Black family formation and to, to really see it as something that, that could be done um, and, and, and be respected. And I went on to follow um, the work that she was doing um, with Stress and Resilience. Um, I met everybody at ABA and became thoroughly entrenched um, in all things Black anthropologists. And, uh, and continued to see myself as one of police students, um, checking in with her from time to time, um, letting her know what I was up to, what I was working on, um, and trying really hard to just uh, continue to be uh, one of her students, even though I didn't continue under her tutelage. And, um, her, her work has just been so important um, and continues to be. I just, I am in the process of finishing the edits on an article that's looking at um, transnational Black feminism and looking at the, the ways that she influenced conversations that we are having with uh, Indigenous, right? People who are scholars in, um, in the Caribbean in West Africa, in other places of the diaspora, and drawing from their voices, um, not just us who go to those places and do work, but drawing on the scholars who are there um, doing that work and, um, and really making that a very important part of our movement forward as Black feminist anthropologists and Black and anthropologists in general, that we, that we do that work. Um, and to draw, you know, the connections that I have with Deb um, as a result of the connections with Lee and, um, 
and John and others. I mean, it's the genealogy is is really important, and um, and so I'm glad that that's one of the questions that we'll be delving into as well. And I'll leave it there because I could help him. Uh, Dr. Baker, yeah, please. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on that, Brache, because you are one one person, but there are many others with the Harlem <clears throat> Birthright Project, as well as the Community Outreach and Research Project. I mean, she mentored an all-star lineup <laughs> of anthropologists, including um, Deborah Thomas, Alika Wally, Sabina Pence, Patricia Tover, and then with the um, outreach, it included Anna Apricio, Audrey Jacobs, Akimi, Andrew Queeley, Beverly Yuan Thompson, and others. And those are just the ones that were formerly on the projects. And then you can throw in, you know, myself, because I worked closely with her and Manning in New York for those years and continuing on. And, and then and then again, and then those students. So to me, one, her research is super important, but the way she mentored, kind of had a lifelong mentoring relationship with many people, and she had such an eye for talent. I mean, like these were like graduate students that just were kind of anxious, and they ended up being just leaders in the field. So to me, one of her greatest legacies is, well, Deb and Rache and all and Alica and many others. Um, as well as Anna, of course, Donna Davis, who was her project leader in that community outreach. So I just, I, you know, she's just a real model for all of us to think about in terms of that quite literally lifelong investment in, in, in helping people through. I could follow that. Um, and I would add Raymond Codrington also to that list of that particular cohort. Um, of students who I met because I took her feminist ethnography class. Um, if you're a student, a grad student in New York, you can take classes at any of the universities. And um, going up to take, you know, to take her class was not only an experience with Leith, but also an experience with the differences between CUNY as an institution and the students who were attracted to CUNY and um, NYU as an institution and the students who ended up at NYU. And so what I found in her class um, through her pedagogy and her relationships with her students, I of course had a really close relationship with my advisor, Connie Sutton, but not everybody had that you know, at uh, NYU. And of course not everybody has that at whatever institution that you're at, but you could just, tell how close she was with her students. And just being in that class, I, I, I wanted to have that, you know, I wanted to experience that. And, um, you know, all of those cohorts, of course, stay close. Leith also gave me my very first anthropological job, Leith and Alika, on the Harlem Birthright um, Project. And I remember that interview, because I, di I didn't know, you know, like, what kinds of questions do people ask you on an interview to be a researcher, you know, as part of a research team? And um, Leith asked me uh, if I were to be doing field work among the vendors who at that point were still allowed to sit along 125th Street, how would I figure out how much money they make in a day without asking them? And I said, I saw, I sat and I thought for a while and I said, well, I guess, you know, I would sit with one person and just watch the transactions and then add it up at the end of the day and ask them something like, is this a normal day? And, and she seemed pleased. And I was so gratified that I had pleased, you know, Leith Mullings and Alika Wally. Um, and, you know, the, the last thing I'll say about her mentorship in terms of cohorts and generations uh, is that, you know, once one is in that circle, going around to conferences, whether it's ABA or SANA or the bigger AAA conferences, um, all of those links of 
uh, cousinship or second cousin and auntie and grandchild and you know becomes so clear and you really do I think feel like you're part of a of an ongoing um, family. Oh right, no, there was one other thing I wanted to say, which was um, uh, and you mentioned this, Michael, also in your essay. Everybody thought she was really shy. And we always found that once she'd had a couple glasses of wine, you know, she would open up in different kinds of, of ways. And that was always super fun. And so one evening um, we were, you know, sitting at dinner and she was talking about Raymond Smith, who was, uh, if not her main advisor, one of her advisors at uh, Chicago. And he was also the advisor at the time for Don Robotham, who came to CUNY as well, but was on my committee. Um, and uh, Diane Austin, uh, then Austin Brews uh, later. And she talked about how she would get papers, you know, papers back from him with just red ink all over the place. And, uh, and that showed her at that point how never to be a professor and how never to be a mentor because she always experienced that as like completely demoralizing. Um, but also as uh, a way to, um, you know, always imagine something better, something stronger, something um, more disciplined, you know? So I think the, both the work ethic and the care sort of comes out of some of those earlier experiences. I'll follow, but um, just so heartwarming to hear so far. And, um, you know, mentorship is a hard thing. And um, I learned from Leith how to be a mentor. I was actually her student as a graduate student when she was still at Columbia. So that's how far back I was her research assistant. And it was just for me, the I don't know, for the, for, the fortune I've had that Lynn Bowles carried me through my tenure fight. And then at the end of that, which was successful, thanks to Lynn, she put this flyer in my office and gave it to me that was an ad for becoming the ethnographer for the Harlem Birthright Project. And we were on the verge of moving to the New York area uh, anyway. So I applied and of course, because I knew Leith, I hoped I would get the job and Leith and I had a great conversation and I um, talked her into hiring me <laughs> to be this ethnographer, even though my field at the time was not urban ethnography. And so she took a chance on me and um, you know, this, experience of working on that project just basically changed my entire approach to anthropology. And um, so you can't really quantify what the impact of her has been. And I was so privileged to, as the course of doing this work, I mean, at, I can't remember what year we left New York, my husband and I and my family, and we moved to Chicago, but we had not finished writing the book um, that stress and resilience. So I would go back to New York to work on the book with her and I would stay with her and Manning. <laughs> and we would have these amazing conversations, you know, um, both with Manning and with Lee and the two of them together uh, <laughs> were such a intellectual powerhouse. And, um, you know, some of the ideas that they were batting back and forth and uh, that, you know, we were all talking about were just have have resonated and remain incredibly relevant in today's struggles. So, um, yeah, we I, I just can't even start to quantify what that means uh, to see how she worked out these ideas that in the end, you know, have endured and uh, beyond uh, the work in Harlem Birthright uh, Project, her um, entire body of work, which is on struggle and resilience and how people uh, go forward and struggle. I think, um, you know, it's just 
beyond brilliant. So <laughs> thank you. So I had a, a different kind of relationship. I was never, uh, maybe obvious, one of her students. Uh, we'd never worked on a project together, a, a research project. We were colleagues. Um, um, she was uh, a little ahead of me, um, but not so much to be an auntie. She was a sister. And um, she was a great colleague. I'm listening to this description of her mentorship, and I'm you know, thinking of that same person. Uh, who was um, helping nurture me um, by, from everything from, well, I think of example, one of the last examples I remember, it's a small thing. She asked me about my relationship with some uh, other colleague uh, who apparently had been complaining in her ear. I explained what the problem was and she said, oh, no, they, and I said, then he was blocking me, so I, moved on. And she said, oh, yeah, that's right. You, they can't block you. That can't be allowed. So this is the kind of, she came to me to ask me about this conversation that she was hearing. Um, and it's important for us to do that kind of thing if we care. Uh, so the many, many other examples, uh, I think in the article I wrote trying to describe in part the fragility of memory. Uh, I uh, talked about her um, opening up doors to places like the Society for Medical Anthropology. And uh, then I walked through. Um, so that that's the part of our relationship that I think relates to mentoring. Dr. Bowles? Oh, uh, if you want to unmute yourself, that'd be lovely. There. Um, 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 similar to Michael, my experience was not as a mentee, um, but um, if thinking in, um, uh, gen, um, in terms of kinship, um perhaps an elder sister um and um and because we shared um uh you know she was close um to uh happy Leacock, um who was part of my uh i guess my mentor group um that um that uh, that group of Helen Sathav, H Happy Leacocks, uh, Connie Sutton, um, and and June Nash, uh, and they all, and it's through them that I met Lise. Um, and part of it is, you know, the old, you know, gatekeeper um, here. Oh, I have a, a young colleague who um, who's doing fabulous work. She just she does this work in in um, in Africa. You know, she went to Chicago, which was you know major major stars for Connie Sutton. Um, and part of um, of what um, uh, developed over oh, I guess my graduate uh, years. Uh, where I went to, <laughs> I wind up going to Jamaica, um, and um, but um, those that interwovenness of our relationship, because in fact, um, I um, I I was good friends with with uh, Manning, um, and is actually through me that you know Manning got his um, his. Uh, walking papers, stars, whatever, uh, because, you know, it was like, this guy is kind of like stalking me, you know, what do I do? 
Uh, and, you know, so then I had to, you know, do the whole, you know, uh, bit. But, but part of that um, was not only, so there was this overlapping of the anthropological, um, the work um, in one of the pieces that I did, I think, for feminist anthropology is I taught um, that that um, that piece talked about what Leith made me do. Um, and part of that was how she pushed um, me to do certain things that I may or may not wanted to be. But one of the things that was I was extraordinarily proud is that she sent me copies of stuff that she was doing. And I was, and I couldn't believe that she valued my comments. Um, and so this was, um, um, I, I just couldn't get over it because here she was just brilliant and I was just like, oh, you know, pathetic. And, but I was just so pleased with myself that she actually thought that my comments were worthy of her reading of them or actually, you know, this is old school, putting it in the mail. Um, you know, we didn't do, you know, and, and I think I might have gotten something in a fax. You know, people don't even know what faxes are. Um, but but part of of that, um, uh, what do you think about this? Do you think I get it? You, do you think I got it right? Do you think I got um, made something uh, concrete in this relationship uh, that I'm trying to explain? Um, and so, so that part, um, as I said, if, if we look in, in uh, genealogical terms, my older sister thought I was okay to, um, to do that kind of work. And um, yeah, so that, that was part of it. And then she made me do all kinds of things that I didn't wanna do. So, um, um, you know, in terms of, you know, do I wanna do president of this? Should I do that? I had no, I, my work um, has been primarily in the Caribbean, specifically in Jamaica. And the next thing I know, I'm signing myself up to be a member of SANA. I said, I don't work in North America. I mean, depending on how you want to see the Caribbean is in terms of North America. But so not only do I become you know, I said, you got to do it. You got to. OK, so I sign up because she, she makes me she makes me sign up. Um, and then, um, the, you know, 10 years later, whatever, I wind up being president of this organization. So it's it becomes uh, um, and where I try to stretch North America to include uh, Mexico and and Canada. Um, and so it's it becomes. Um, yeah, but she made me do it. So that that was part of. Um, um, I don't have a big sister, uh, but yeah, um, but that's how how that rolled. Thank you, Dr. Bowles. Um, that actually kind of leads sort this sort of language around uh, kinship and this kind of like family connections, um, sort of you know, leads into this question that I had for you, Dr. Bowles, um, because in your essay uh, for, for this issue, you talked about the Black Women's Studies course at Maryland um, that kind of came apart through the Sisters Circle Collective. Um, and I was really struck by the kind of mention of the brown paper bag lunches and this sort of community. Um, and you talk about the importance of Lee's work uh, in the introductory course um, and using her in the syllabi. Um, and but also how that course was one of your own legacies. So I was hoping you could maybe speak a little bit to um, like, you know, thinking about her insistence on collaborative research. Can you speak to that relationship between collaboration and legacy and sort of if you see similar spaces of exchange um, to the circle, that sort of sister circle group now? Yeah. Um, well, uh, just to say that the sister circle has semi disbanded. Uh, we've gone off in different kinds of ways. Um, but one of the things um, um, that, that, uh, that I tried to show in that article was how we use our, pa our power to get this course, 
which I will say is they're 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 offering it um, this semester. Um, so it's so it's it's um it it lives um, now whether or not um, and I, I I kind of doubt that. Well, maybe um, I didn't see the syllabus, but um, maybe um, uh, pieces of uh, uh, Lee's work are are still there in in the syllabus. But it's being the course is being still offered, so it's still alive. Um, the other part um, that um, that um, was that was important. Well, two things that were important. One was the, um, that not only the uh, the use of black women's power in the the in the nineteen end of the nineteen nineties uh, at University of Maryland was. Um, not only important in terms of collaborative work, um, but but in addition to the book that we um, that we did, um, the circle the sister circle, um, but also that using um, using um, on our own terms, um, because in fact I had read a number of these articles way back when Leith had first presented them. So it was, and I kidded her, I said, this is, this is Leith's greatest hits. And uh, she would, you know, it's like, she says, yeah, it's greatest, you're, these, these are incredible essays. They are going to live through time. And in fact, um, I refer to them now, um, even when I'm doing something, I refer to it. Um, to one of those pieces and uh, the importance of of um, the importance of her um, the importance of struggle that it just continues um, in through uh, that work, but then also the work her more recent work where she worked with Charlie Hale. So it's it's part of of um, that um, that um, the importance of those connections that that I guess I wound up being kind of the linchpin on bringing her into that, and then in fact a number of 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 my colleagues at Maryland at that time were uh, knew her, um, knew her uh, Bonnie Thornton Dill, who at one time was at Memphis. Um, uh, was very, um, really um, was part of, of um, uh, not, not necessarily black feminist work, but the importance of, of, of uh, you know, structural racism and, and how that meant in terms of poverty and, and women's poverty. Um, and so this, this, all of these things kind of were able to pull things together um, and uh, and then it was realized in this course that, as I say, it's being court, it's being offered in 2022. And I, I, I did the first run um, in 2000. So 22, 22 years later, um, it's still going. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Bowles. Um, Dr. Blakey, I, I had a question for you. As we're thinking about this um, sort of the syllabi, the citational practices, this sort of um, yeah, collaborative and engaging other scholars. Um, in your in your essay, you interrogate the absence of citation by quote mainstream anthropologist practitioners numbed by whiteness. Uh, who also often uh, ignore intellectual labor of black and racialized scholars. And you suggest that the next generation enters a harder historic point of confluence that will demand decisiveness. I was hoping you could speak a little bit more to that. And in what ways do Leith's contributions provide a foundation for the practice of decisiveness in amidst this white anthropology? And kind of additionally, um, as more Black and BIPOC uh, anthropologists are leaving the leaving anthropology and entering ethnic studies departments and with the fluctuation in the job market, can you speak to like how anthropologists might bring this decisiveness into practice? Really just, can you kind of expand on that in relation to what Leith might offer? 
Thank you. Yeah, well, um, that's a lot. Um, and, uh, and you're right, it's important. I mean, we can, I sometimes uh, lately have thought about Frederick Douglass's uh, autobiography. And there's a point in it when, you know, there's a meeting on the road, Douglass and a couple of other enslaved people over on the Eastern shore of Maryland. And a slaveholder rides up on his horse and asks them something about basically how they liked, how they liked it. <laughs> What they, what they thought of their master. And one of these enslaved people with Douglas says, that tells the truth, that he was, you know, in other words, that he was cruel and he disliked it. And the next thing you knew in the, his, Douglas's narrative, that man had been sold south, um, possibly to hell, you know, the cane fields of Louisiana. Uh, when I think about this opposition uh, to critical race theory today, that is what comes to mind. When uh, the other voice comes into the room, we raise the criticisms, we raise the veil, we peel off the cover, and they don't like it. Um, so that the status quo depends, uh, demands a lack of criticism, uh, accommodation. And it's been difficult, thank goodness, for African-Americans of all kinds, but our scholars uh, to go with that. Uh, they have been the voice of what I think of as thing of critical race theory and understanding truth to be often subjective, I would say it's the only truth of which a great society is worthy. And so that's, they won't have it. So there's a fight to get that in, in this, uh, what I, uh, the uh, intellectual anthropology as white space becomes an intellectually gated white community. And so nonetheless, you know, we show up, we push, Leith found her way into the middle of it. One of the first to be, you know, an officer in associations and to organize as part of the AAA, organizing um, more critical and uh, ideas, organizing in a struggle um, uh, for, you know, a, a humane anthropology. The other, uh, so the other side of your question, as I remember, uh, has to do with that piece that I was, I worked through um, in the language of Stuart Hall. You know, I'm remembering my, my friend of 40 years and what, what, what did we have in common? What were we, what did we do? What did she do that I saw? And, um, you know, there's a Jamaica connection there with the three of us and, and an immigrant connection. Uh, though we went, she and I, different, each of us in different directions. I don't know Stuart Hall personally. I'm just saying, saying memory, think, uh, imagination. And so his language was as good as any to talk about this, you know, being at this, at a confluence of events. Um, that history doesn't just make itself, but there's momentum and there are precedents. And then there's the moment. That's part of all that. And Leith was always uh, ready on the moment. Um, but I don't think her moments, whether it was taking leadership of the AAA or for various projects and work with students or uh, the smaller things she, you know, things like organizing a 
Black Lives Matter protest at the AAA meeting. I don't think those moments just occurred arbitrarily. I know they did not. She had an agenda and was on a mission well thought through and revised and critiqued throughout her life. And so if I had something to say to younger anthropologists, obviously not those in this room who, who know this, I would ask, do you have a mission? Do you have an agenda beyond yourself? Because that's the critical difference. There are folks who think that serving themselves, I've heard them say this out loud, <laughs> is, is even an uplifting African-American a part of the struggle. It may facilitate some things, but it needs to facilitate something other than that. So I would just, you know, maybe I should leave it there. Thank you, Dr. Blakey, for posing that, that question as well. Um, I'd like to, uh, to ask Dr. Barnes um, about your articles. You, you really, I really enjoyed how you sort of set up that work in uh, staging an ethnographic encounter between Leith Mullings and yourself. Um, and you discussed the impact of her work on your research, as well as the space between your research um, and especially the regional and kind of class differentiations um, that you kind of focused on. Um, is there any scholarship or are there any junior scholars that are making you excited or reposturing yourself to think of the space between your research and uh, Mulling's research as generative? How do you see this intellectual uh, genealogy developing? Yeah, I love that question. Um because it's so important to me um, to, to continue to pay homage to the people who have helped me along, um, who have helped me develop my, just develop my framework as a Black feminist anthropologist and, and, and to think about how I can continue to, to help others. Um, and so I have to say to start that Aisha really helped me with the language of situating that encounter, that ethnographic encounter. I was, I was trying to write it and it was really hard to write because um, Lee's always been larger than life to me. Like, <laughs> um, you know, there were just, uh, I think because she was also, most of the time really quiet. Um, it, you know, it, it also created this aura around her when I was, you know, when I was a graduate student and a junior person that was just like, how can I, you know, I want to be worthy of being in your presence. I had to chuckle at, at Deb saying like, I was just, you know, so proud of myself for having that, that satisfactory answer because I felt that way so much in conversations with Lee, like, Am I saying the right thing? Um, so it was really hard to be in a in a situation, especially at the beginning of my research, where I felt like I was saying something that she wouldn't agree with, like that. And she and she actually said she did. You know, she actually said she didn't agree with. Um, and and pushing forward anyway. Um, you know, figuring out that there was a reason to do to do this work that looked at you know, the specificity of being in the South and the specificity of being specifically in Atlanta, right? That creates a, an entirely different relationship with race and class and gender than just about any other place in the country. Probably, you know, I talk to my students about this all the time. With the exception of like DC and Houston, like Atlanta is, is one of the few places where you can do this kind of work. And, um, and so, yeah, I, you know, Fortunately, unfortunately, I've been at small liberal arts colleges for most of my career. So I haven't been, um, you know, necessarily um, mentoring the next generation of students who are going to be doing, you know, building on the work from, from, from me forward, right? Engaging we because of me and moving forward 
um, in that way. Um, I'd like to say that my undergraduates um, get, you know, an earful <laughs> um, of Lee's work, uh, reading it and thinking through it. Um, and I continue to cite her uh, in my own work, but I'm just recently in a position of having graduate students. Um, so I'm looking forward to being able to, you know, really, um, really, you know, bring forward the importance of, of this kind of ethnographic work, the work that is based in the U.S., the work that's based in Black communities in the U.S., the work that's based on um, on Black feminisms and, um, and, and Black women and Black motherhood in particular. I have been fortunate, though, to, to share space with some new um, and rising scholars that I do want to you know, lift their names and their work because I think they are engaging. Um, they're, they're engaging the spirit, even if they're not concentrated in the work that she's doing. Um, uh, or the work that she's done and, and continue, right, and is continuing to be done. So um, I had the fortune of being on a panel with Stephanie Keeney Parks, who's a graduate student at UCLA. And um, her work was really fascinating because she was actually using my framing of Black strategic mothering to think through um, the healthcare disparities faced by African-American families that have children with autism and all the things that you have to navigate um, to be able to maneuver the education um, that, your, that your children deserve, right? Um, so situating the work within their own lived experiences, um, it was something that she was experiencing herself. So there was um, a bit of native and autoethnographic work uh, happening there as well. Um, and really rooted in um, health disparities um, and lived experiences. Of course, we all know our superstar uh, graduate student turned uh, uh, highly accomplished professor Chelsea Carter, um, who is doing uh, you know research on um, on black folks who are navigating Lou Gehrig's disease, and again looking at you know, health disparities and, you know, even the, the basic, you know, situation of, of not getting the right diagnosis in a timely manner. Um, and, uh, and then there's Eshe Cole, um, who does work on uh, Black motherhood. Um, she's uh, at Connecticut, I'm sorry, University of Connecticut and um, looks at reproductive justice, um, looks at reproductive health and well-being of Black women in the United States, and also um, puts particular uh, focus on community organizing and, um, and how Black women are organizing um, themselves uh, in response to some of these challenges. Um, and then uh, Jaleesa Jolly, um, who I had the great fortune of meeting at an Oswald conference. Um, I think it was the year Deb was president, if I'm not mistaken. No, not president. What were you? You were the speaker. You were the keynote, something. <laughs> I remember you were talking about that, the digital project that you were working on at that conference. But anyway, Jalisha and I met at the conference. She was still in grad school at the time. She's now a professor at Amherst College. And she does work on uh, Black women in Jamaica who are navigating HIV and has, um, and has um, challenged, you know, kind of um, directed that work into some US-based work as well. Um, but is really interested in transnational politics of gender, structural racism, um, and intersectionality as it relates to HIV and AIDS. Um, she's done so much work with Black feminist health science, Black motherhood, birth justice, um, and it's just really a phenomenal rising scholar. She is not an anthropologist, um, but she's definitely using a lot of our um, tools uh, to do the work that she does. Uh, and then the other two I want to list aren't so junior anymore. Um, I think we're um, you know, contemporaries in terms of our career um, progression, although I may be a few years older than them in terms of age. 
Um, but Lacan Dill, um, who was one of the people I reached out to to see if they would want to make a contribution to this issue. Lacan wanted to, but um, didn't have the the time and space energy to be able to do it. It was it was a hard thing to do for a lot of people um, who felt particularly spiritually close to me. And um, Lacan's work really um, uh, she's at um, Michigan State. Um, and her work really mirrors uh, Leafs in a lot of ways because she's she's interested in um, health disparities, um, but focusing on um, historically disinvested neighborhoods. So her work really reminds me of the Harlem Bird Project. Um, and she looks specifically at young people and how they are um, creating their own personal resources and strategies to navigate their wellness, looking at girlhood and, and things like that. And then Catherine Mariner, um, who uh, wrote Contingent Kinship, um, but I'm really, really excited for her new project, um, which is called Furrow Ground. Um, and it's where she's investigating the relationship between race and placemaking in Rochester. Um, and so she, and I, I, I think I really connect with Kate's work because we both have done like family and kinship stuff and then have kind of moved that, um, pro, you know, moved those projects along to kind of looking at um, community based and participatory approaches to, um, to you know, the questions that were, were asked me, right? The questions that we're interested in on a, on a broader level. So, you know, so she's interested in, um, you know, kind of understanding um, in community and kinship and, and space and place. Um, and I am too. So my current project is looking at um, how Black women navigate school choice in that I'm back in Atlanta and I'm looking at a particular community. And, and you know, so that's it's that same kind of community participatory research that was such a hallmark of, um, of you know, how so many of us came to know and love Luke's work. Um, so those were, the, those were the folks that immediately came to mind when, you know, when I got a chance to look at, at your questions. Um, and I'm sure I'm missing tons of people, um, but uh, that's, those are the folks that I'm thinking of right now. Thank you so much, Dr. Barnes. And maybe, um, you know, on Twitter, this is a like something that people can engage with. Like, who is engaging with Leaf's work now? At them, and uh, we want to make sure that we're, you know, providing a platform for folks who are, you know, continuing that work. Oh, yes. I just wanted to add to that. This is one line of Leaf's. Yes, yes, yes. Leaf has yes. so many. Absolutely. <laughs> she has branches. You know. Um, of you know of scholars i mean you know i i've i've had a chance you know she she was pulling people together in the the months before her passing um who were doing work in other parts of the world um you know and so those are additional genealogies you know that you know i can't even begin to <laughs> you know Point right, point directly to um, that. It's so important for us to lift those too. So, if, if any of those folks are, I would like to ask if it's okay. I hope it's okay. If any of those folks are on this call um, who were, you know, involved in some of the the collaborative work that Leaf was doing, you know, within the last year, it would be so great to, you know, hear hear, you know, kind of put something in the chat. Let us know you're in the space. Yes, please, please, um, and we'll open it up. I have a couple more questions and then we'll sort of open it up to uh, folks. And yes, if, if you wanna share in the chat and on Twitter, we would love to uh, uplift those folks as well. Um, sort of speaking about the many threads of the work, um, I kind of wanted to speak with um, Dr. Wally. I wanted to ask you about stress and resilience. It's been 20 years um, since the publication. And um, when I was reading your retrospective review, you kind of spoke to how after presenting your, st your study, the CDC was sort of like 
No, structural racism is not <laughs> to blame for this. Um, however, in like sort of this post George Floyd world, more folks are starting to, to be like, oh yes, that could be uh, what is going on. Um, so I'm curious, how do you see this discussion of race, class and gender and health put forth in, in Mulling's work and in stress and resilience developing currently? Um, where are you seeing her cited? Where are you still seeing a lack of citations? And then how do we sort of address this considering the persistence of those uh, statistics 20 years after this, your publication? Yeah, so much, so much to say about that and about what people are saying here. Um, you know, when we did the Harlem Birthright Project, um, just remember there was, I don't think we had Twitter. We definitely did not have Twitter or Facebook or any of that, right? And so we were working in a time when you put out your work and you assume people are reading it and citing it. And this is what I tried to say, but in fact, you know, the, the what Michael alluded to, the gateway and the, you know, gatekeepers and the sort of, um, and Lynn has talked about, you know, prevented the, the groundbreaking work that Harlem Birthright was um, from really entering into dialogue. And I was uh, only after she passed, um, did I get a call or email from the medical anthropology quarterly saying they wanted to do, just as TA did, a big issue, special issue on uh, LEAD's impact in medical anthropology. And they said, none of her work had ever been cited in MAQ. And I was like, what? It's, you know, that was entirely shocking to me that no, that medical anthropologists were not in dialogue with LEAD. And that's, you know, I mean, from the beginning, she was a medical anthropologist, she was a nurse. So, you know, that was shocking. Um, so I, I think, you know, the fact that the CDC at that time, uh, refused to basically understand, and it wasn't just our study, as I point out in the, in my piece, it was five studies that were done, qualitative research that showed that um, provided the evidence. I think ours was had the most evidence, but I'm biased, but that's because Leith insisted. You know, Leith knew, as, as Michael said, um, that you can't just talk about this stuff. You gotta, you have to be rigorous in how you do it. That's why she had, you know, I think there were four ethnographers, right? Um, Deborah, it was four or five ethnographers and uh, it wasn't just, one ethnographer, she she invented or she helped construct this methodology that was beyond participatory. It was like groundbreaking in the way it was collaborative. It was the first time I'd ever done team ethnography, um, for example, um, because nobody was doing team ethnography at that time. I don't, you know, so, um, she wanted to make sure that we had the most compelling evidence for what we were trying to say. And I think we did. In spite of that, the CDC did not wanna hear that evidence at that time. And I think that now, um, you know, with Black Lives Matter coming to the fore, with the activism on the streets, and which Leith is also documented, right as you know that was I think her final project um brilliant article that she wrote and I'm forgetting the name of the book but um probably the last collective um it was a edited volume her article on the Black Lives Matter movement which is really so powerful um the, the way that intersectionality has entered into public discourse, the way that, you know, structural racism has entered into, it is, is finally, maybe it took 20 years, but it's finally something that is coming to the forefront in terms of at least 
some glimmer of understanding and even with and the backlash against it, it will persist as a explanatory framework, I think. And um, just yesterday I heard on the news that the disparity in maternal mortality rates remains um, high between African-American women and black women and white women and so on. And, um, but the explanation that was given, and this was by somebody at a high level working on global maternal mortality was it was structural racism. That was the reason behind high rates of maternal mortality. So something is shifting. It's gonna take longer, I think, for, you know, for that to lead to actual policy change, although there, there is some shift there too happening um, in terms of funds being allocated in the rescue plan and so on. Um, and, you know, um, both Vice President Harris and President Biden talking at least about trying to address the inequities. I don't think they're getting very far, but and this is this is at least something. And I think had the book come out now, we would have used the social media platforms. We would have done a better job of sort of making visible our argument and it would have gotten a lot more attention, if you will. But I think like Donna Ann has been using parts of the Sojourner Syndrome framework or building on that. And so I think, you know, the uh, work itself has um, continued to have an impact and will continue to have an impact. I just want to also say that um, Chelsea Carter and a couple other of the scholars are um, in a new publication from SANA, the Journal of American, uh, Journal of Association of North American Anthropology. Sorry, John, I should know this. Um, we just put out an issue um, that's uh, about the state of anthropology uh, today and Chelsea, uh, is got an article in there. It's based on a spring program we did. I have another article that goes even deeper than the one in transforming anthropology into the impact that we had on our work and on collaborative anthropology and so on. Um, so please also look at that um, to add to Richet's list <laughs> of um, work influenced by Leaf and uh, I just, um, I think that, uh, you know, the work is powerful and because it's powerful, it will have an impact and it'll continue to have an impact um, despite the gatekeeping, despite the barriers um, and despite, you know, the white nationalist backlash against uh, all of this, uh, way that we're talking about um, the impact of and of racism and racism in intersecting with class and gender, and that's really important to keep in mind and um, you know keep working on, which I think these younger scholars are doing today. Thank you so much, Dr. Wallace. But no, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to, to shift to Dr. Thomas. I'd love to ask you about your, your contribution to this issue. You sort of frame your analysis of contemporary realignments of global, global capitalism uh, using the concept of epochal shift. Um, how has LEAF influenced the ways in which we address the shifting continuities and discontinuities of the Western imaginary? And how can her methodological frameworks, along with her the theoretical contributions of changing structural conditions and, and forms of inequality, inform anthropologists engaging with ever emergent and becoming realities? If you, would, if you can speak to that. Small question. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. And just, I think uh, to go back to something that Alika said, um, before I explicitly um, address the question you've asked. Um, I wanted to say too that, um, you know, Leith 
published in a way that was similar to how my advisor published, right? Published collectively, published um, with journals or edited volumes that came out of community with whom she was writing. Um, which meant it wasn't always in like the sexy location, which is another, you know, as Lynn and many others have pointed out, which is another way that the work that she's done is not amplified as much as it um, could and should be. But those are conscious choices that she made as well to not chase after, you know, the, um, whatever would come with publishing um, in, in certain other kinds of locations. So it means that people who, you know, and it's true that ideas come around at different moments and resurface and, um, but, uh, you know, it's why in many ways that, um, you know, when we think about uh, phenomena like, you know, her dissertation research phenomena, you know, the kind of uptick in accusations about witchcraft. Um, and she, in that, in her first book, in her dissertation, then in her first book, links that to changes in the political economy. You know, it's why we cite the Komarovs for that rather than her study coming out of the 70s. And I'm not saying that to, you know, detract from, modernity and its malcontents or, or any of um, that work, but just to say that, uh, you know, those ideas were articulated before and by a black woman. And, um, and you know, there's the political economy to the citation, there's the political economy to the kind of um, modes of uh, academic kind of class and um, celebration, I suppose. And she, you know, liked to not be in that. But, it, and so one of the effects of that is that um, a broader public has not bothered to look for her work, you know, and, um, and cite the earlier iteration of the insight, you know, that's one example, but I think it's a really important one. Um, and it, I guess it leads into your question, because I think, uh, you know, one of the things that I obviously learned from Leith and also from Connie was that one always has to keep in mind or keep in the same kind of analytic framework, uh, a global politi political economy and sort of geopolitics at multiple levels of scale, at the local level, at a regional level, at a national level, the global level transnational um, with the kinds of interpersonal and structural forms of inequality, discrimination, affect, um, though she wouldn't have used that word um, in that way, um, you know, and to constantly keep both frames in view, right? So, um, you know, her urging for us to think about in the annual review essay, to think about racism rather than race, for example, should have been field changing, right? Um, and is, you know, for many of us, but it should have been completely field changing as something in line with the decolonizing um, moments, uh, you know, that of course, Michael tracks back to Frederick Douglass, but if we think of those different moments like the Faye Harrison's volume and then Jafari and Ryan's essay, you know, there are these different stages um, in which that essay should feature prominently um, as well and should have shifted the lens. You know, it is, it is important obviously to think through the ways something that we call race is forged and formed and mobilized and deployed and imagined. Um, but what she was really encouraging us to do was to um, attend to the effects, right? And attend to the constant uh, structural historical violences of racism and how they manifest in different moments, in different locations, and to see this as a global phenomenon, not just a new world phenomenon or not just an American phenomenon, but something that in fact um, 
also occurs in majority black societies. You know? So um, I guess what I would say to your question is, um, you know, the constant attention to the sort of political economy and the sociocultural interactive dimensions of a problem or a question or an issue um, is, uh, you know, an approach that Leith had that she transmuted to all of us. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. Does that make sense? Oh, and I think you wanted to think through institution building or uh, and or community engagement. I mean, I think that, you know, we all do that in different ways, certainly learning from Leith and Alika as part of the Harlem Birthright Project about um, uh, co community in, engaged research with communities where people in the community shape the questions, you know, as opposed to the way as many people are taught in graduate school that you have, you know, you have a question and you figure out where is the best place to investigate that question? You know, that was never a, a, a thing for her or for me or for I'm sure any of you here. So to see that in process with the Harlem Birthright Project, um, to be in those focus groups that we held and to hear the, the, the feedback channel through which questions were developed and modes of analysis were imagined um, jointly, um, I think was an important example for me. You know, for me, I take it in a little bit of a different way, having come from a background as a performer. You know, I'm interested in, um, you know, how artists do that too, you know, and how, um, a, an artistic and a creative engagement with people in a community uh, is also then a collaborative participatory mode of knowledge formation. And so my impetus has been to, you know, build spaces where people who do that or are into that or think they might be into that could find other people who say, yes, it's legitimate to do that. And I think that's the kind of umbrella that Leith created for many of us. Yes, it's legitimate to be asking these questions. And yes, it's legitimate to do an analysis that foregrounds structural historical racism as the basis for health problems or um, you know, neighborhood inequality or any of the various um, forms of research um, that she did, and also to highlight people's own responses, um, innovations. Um, you know, I think the the lovely thing about the coining of the sojourner syndrome is that it doesn't only articulate the kind of structural historical problem, but it also um, sort of just in the term, you know, instantiates the resilience. And that's what she was, um, you know, committed to really uplifting the ways that we, that black people all over the world, um, you know, make a way out of no way and also demonstrating the constant pressures that people face. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas, for that uh, thoughtful response. Um, I'd like to uh, turn to Dr. Baker. Um, I do have a question for you, but I also know that you have some materials to share as well. And I think everyone here will be really grateful for that. So I'll pose my question. Um, and uh, I think Machiko, who's running the tech right now, if you can just make sure that uh, Dr. Baker is able to share his screen and uh, after you can, can kind of show and share those materials with everyone. Um, so just considering your work on the history of anthropology, uh, including your article in the, in the current issue, discussing the racist anti-racism within the discipline, how might we call on Leith to think about new forms of resistance that might emerge from this restructuring? So we see like these institutional efforts to develop anti-racist practices. Um, how, how might these re-entrench those or like re-entrench those, but also what can we do to sort of resist um, that restructuring um, as well? So I'm just gonna turn to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, 
Deborah was talking about the um, towards uh, anti-racist anthropology and the way Lee sort of just threw it in vivid relief that while anthropologists have been so-called engaged in anti-racist, um, well, against scientific racism, I should say, which was anti-racist to some degree, this focus on race actually was sort of racist. And so, you know, that really motivated me to sort of go into the archives and push this and find, um, you know, the way Franz Boas was thinking about this and with all the best intentions, right? That <laughs> roads to hell or whatever. Um, he actually was doing the work of consolidating whiteness, which was part of the white supremacy project. And a lot of people have not, you know, sort of pieced that through. At the same time, of course, he, you know, earnestly kind of thought amalgamation was the appropriate way to fight racism. And we go through the logic and stuff, but you kind of like, what was he thinking? Um, but he was sincere and he was sort of approaching this with a commitment towards anti-racism. That said, I think also this, um, you know, all of these efforts of addressing structural racism, you know, whiteness, white supremacy, you know, to some degree in the post George Floyd moment has been great. It's not been too much, but what has happened in just two years, the vicious backlash of these legislatures that are coming down against, um, well, both uh, redistricting in Alabama, um, as well as North Carolina, um, as well as not teaching critical race theory. If you're not teaching critical race theory, you're teaching propaganda. It's plain and simple. I mean, it's like, you just want us to teach rah, rah, American imperialism propaganda without an, you know, without an attenuation to immigration race. I mean, it's just, it, so the backlash I think is really important. We have to just do more in terms of addressing structural racism than just platitudes on a website and a commitment to, um, you know, mitigate white, Privilege. I mean, it's just, it just has to go further than that. I think Lee understood that, particularly she understood, um, you know, the global fight against racism. And I think she was onto that in the last, you know, months of her life, actually. Um, so anyway, that was kind of motivated, you know, that one article motivated me to do the history of this relationship with focusing on race in, in for anthropology. And we tell ourselves the story um, that, you know, Boaz and others were really anti-racist. And to a degree, they were fighting, you know, scientific racism. At the same time, they're consolidating whiteness and arguing for Negro amalgamation. So, um, and that I think to me is another key piece. Um, Amy Cox's work is so important on this. Um, Irian X. Kendi is important as well, is that a lot of this anti-racist, um, rhetoric and even organizing and promotion like on Amazon and everything else, it's kind of still contingent on assimilation. And assimilation is racism. And so until we break out of that, it's gonna be really hard to really have truly anti-racist initiatives and organizing because there's still a lot of this white norming and assimilation, even though there may be some lip service otherwise, um, you know, that's going to be a, something that I think is going to be a, a challenge um, moving on. So let me share some, if I can do this, um, some I think, you know, we all know that uh, Leith was fearless <laughs> and um, And I'm thinking there might be reasons why. Do, do people see a flight manifest? So this is a flight, you know, I, when I, I actually had the honor of writing her obituary for AA, and it was one of the hardest, most emotional things I've ever written, like in my life. 
but it was fun also to do some research and digging around to see, um, you know, her origin story, if you will. And come to find out, this was her first trip to the United States. As I understand, her mom and dad went first. She was living with her grandparents. Um, and they sent her over at three years old, three, <laughs> by herself. I talked to Patsy and some of her other um, relatives, and um, they do not know any of these Jamaicans. So maybe there was someone they know, but probably not. So she was, um, I don't know, you know, where her twin was, I don't know all this, but it was her by herself um, on the KLM West Indies division where they were going from Kingston to Miami. And this was the plane she must have flown on. You can see they didn't even have KLM, but they had the actual Dutch letters. Um, but can you imagine a three-year-old getting onto this airplane, driving from Clint, uh, riding from Kingston to Miami? I mean, it would just be harrowing, but her bravery and her steadfastness may have come from this first plane trip by herself. Um, and then when she was in high school, she went to the predominantly white high school, uh, Jamaica High School, and this is her in 1961. And she was the editor of the Hilltopper. And you can see down here, and it, it is officially run by a nucleus of editors, namely Lionel Nelson and Leith Mullings. And there she is <laughs> amongst all the white editors. So she's been publishing um, from early on. And this is her high school, um, you know, the, the, the high school page where she was on in the M's and I blew this up. So she was the associate editor of the Hilltopper. Of course, she was in the girls league um, and the scholarship club. And she was part of the library squad. Now, I don't know what the library squad was. I actually looked up, there was not a lot of research on that, but she was obviously into reading and writing, women at feminist studies, the girls league and scholarship at the age of like, and she was young too. I think she was like four, 15, she graduated early. So she must've been 15 or 16 at this age. So I just thought that this would be sort of interesting to share and sort of endearing to get another little glimpse at the early Leith Mullings. Taking a plane <laughs> <laughs> by herself <laughs> at the age of three. And then of course, you know, probably, she probably was of course the editor. They just say the other man was the editor, but you can imagine she was editing that. So I just wanted to share some of those documents I stumbled over. I thought they were kind of endearing and speak volumes to the way she developed over the course of her career. Thank you so much, Dr. Baker. I think we all just really appreciate you sharing that and uh, providing that today. Um, we are at time. Um, I want to be mindful of everyone's, uh, you know, busy schedules. If I would love to just open it up to the audience just for a moment, if anyone has um, something they'd like to share. Um, and if, of course, if any of you have to hop off, I completely understand. But if we can just give a moment to folks who might want to share, I would love to hear if there's any students of Leith's uh, in the audience, any colleagues from the Graduate Center. Um, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you so uh, folks can hear you. Um, but yeah, and that would be a great time. And unless there's um, from the panelists, if you have more that you want to add to, just as we're kind of wrapping up, um, please feel free to unmute yourself. Oh, I have someone uh, raising their hands. Oh, Sheila Walker. Hello, good to see you <laughs> or hear you. Um, Hi, it was thrilling to hear all of you talk about Leaf. Leaf and I, and I were roommates in graduate school at the University of Chicago, and we were both kind of victims of R.T. Smith. Um, <laughs> and so in our last conversation, he, of course, was a topic. Um, but I would never have gotten through the University of Chicago without Leaf. We were each other's support system. I 
thinking about her, I'm reminded of uh, our role with the Black Student Association. We were kind of, uh, I like to think of us as Les Sœur Nadal of the Black uh, Student Association. Les Sœur Nadal were major organizers of the Negritude Movement in Paris. Um, I like to think that we played that role. Maybe I'm being presumptuous with the Black students at the University of Chicago in the 60s, 70s. And we defended our dissertations on the same day with the same folks. And Charles Long, African-American historian of religion was the savior of the two of us from our uh, all white male by definition professors. So um, <laughs> Leith was always a serious one. I wanted to dance. But um, <laughs> when hearing that she was seen as so serious until she had a couple of glasses of wine, I was privy to, you know, Leith as a very serious person who was so much fun. So this was a wonderful opportunity to re-experience somebody I miss tremendously. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Walker, for sharing. Um, if there's anyone else that wants to, to share, um, raise your hand, please. And if not, then we might we might wrap up just to be mindful of folks, folks' time. Oh, Dr. Blakey. I just want to say really briefly, I, I remember in the uh, questions you were initially thinking about, the question about how to memorialize her. This is uh, something I see a lot. And as even as I thought about my piece, I thought about memorializing. And so often, you know, whether it's in uh, South Africa, uh, towards the end of apartheid, or in New York during slavery, and Virginia during slavery and elsewhere, you know, funerals were important moments for recommitting to struggle upon the death of one of our members, uh, someone as distinguished as Leith Mullings, who is now an ancestor. Um, you think about that history and that person's uh, abilities and commitment and recommit yourself to the struggle for all of us. And I hope that we will do that around Leith's record, that we remember her record and her work. And then finally, and this is something that seems most obvious in this moment uh, of Black Lives Matter, that we say her name, because we've already heard Alaka has given us an example, but there are many and many more to come of how these contributions that have been put to the side, that history calls upon them to be brought forward, like the importance of structural racism, the empowered, the next thing you know, will have been the authors of those. Watch for it. <laughs> Call her name, make sure that she is accredited for what she's done. So that's how I will memorialize her. So beautiful, Michael, and so right, right on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Blakey. I feel like we should leave it there with that really powerful, powerful message. Thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for participating. Thank you to the panelists for uh, helping to hold this space today together, uh, for sharing your memories, your insights. Um, and thank you for all the folks in the audience who joined us today. Um, we certainly can continue this conversation uh, in Twitter and uh, in other spaces. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, Dr. Barnes, I see your hands raised. Oh, sorry, Savannah, because I really did want to leave us with with Michael's closing words, but I felt I would be remiss if I didn't say that that ABA is starting a, a book award in uh, in Lee's name, and we're working on the 
and with with the family and working with AAA and working with everyone to get that in place. But I I just felt like I would be remiss if we didn't say in how we're remembering her, memorializing her, that we aren't also doing that. Thank you, Dr. Burns. Yes, yes. Savannah, thank you for being our host. This yes. host. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you all. I really am so grateful for this space and uh, we will continue this. We will continue to remember Leith and uh, as, as Dr. Blakey said, so thank you and have a lovely rest of your day. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.